Welcome to the Maine Public Broadcasting's coverage of Governor Paul LePage's third State of the State Address. I'm Mal Leary, Managing Editor of MPBN's Maine Capital Connection. Joining me is A.J. Higgins, State House Bureau Chief for MPBN. We're simulcasting our coverage on radio and TV and streaming it on mpbn.net. The legislature's already in a joint meeting of the House and Senate, waiting for Governor LePage to arrive in the House chamber. A.J., what can we expect from the governor in his speech as he's entering the chamber? Well, Mel, you know, as, uh, as most Mainers are well aware, this is a governor who came to office with a very strong business background, wanted to run the state of Maine like a business, and we can expect to see a lot of uh, proposals that are advanced tonight that are consistent with his business-friendly policies for the state of Maine. Um, among those uh, primarily have been uh, uh, opposing uh, existing programs uh, that are costly to the state, such as uh, welfare, and uh, also trying to find ways to uh, save the state money and increase uh, job creation through um, measures that uh, would perhaps bring more affordable energy to Maine. And I expect we'll hear a lot of some of the themes he's been hitting on recently, like his opposition to Medicaid expansion. Yes, that is, if, and if you look at it from a businessman's point of view, that's a benefit that he finds that's a little bit too uh, expensive for his shareholders, who in this case would be the taxpayers of the state of Maine. Um, in fact, he feels that the system that we have is already too costly and that we can't afford to expand uh, to an additional 70,000 people. The governor is shaking hands with members of legislative leadership. Uh, up at the front of the House chamber, getting ready to be introduced by the Senate President, Justin Alfond, who, as the Senate President, is in chair of this joint convention. Joint convention meaning both chambers are meeting in the same location in order to hear the address from the governor that, by the way, is mandated in the Constitution. Big night for the governor tonight, Mal. Uh, this is probably could very well be uh, in this election year the largest uh, statewide audience that he's going to see uh, this year. And it gives him a chance to really uh, lay out uh, the accomplishments that he feels his administration has reached over the last three years. The chair would like to thank this evening's Herald, Staff Sergeant Douglas Conley. He's accompanied by Lieutenant Colonel Daniel Goodhart. Would they please rise and accept the warm greetings of the convention? Chair would also like to welcome all of tonight's military personnel who are joining us this evening. Will they please rise and accept the warm greetings of the convention. The chair would request Governor Paul R. LePage to please step forward to address the joint convention. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Chief Justice Softly, who continually fights with me to come down on the right side, <laughs> members of the 126th Legislature, distinguished guests, and my fellow citizens, tonight I am here to update you, the people of Maine, 
about the condition of our state. First, I would like to recognize a few individuals. To my lovely wife, Anne, and my children, Lindsay, Lisa, Lauren, and Paul, please stand. I would not be here tonight or the person I am without all of you and your continued support. And Anne, you have made Maine proud for the work you do with the military. Thank you. Staff Sergeant Douglas Connolly, the Military Herald this evening, thank you for the courageous service to our nation. And as I thank our military men and women, we are reminded of those who are not here with us this evening. Bill Knight greeted thousands of troops returning from Iraq and Afghanistan at the Bangor International Airport. A World War II veteran, Bill was from the greatest generation. Bill died on Christmas Day at the age of 91. In the latter part of his life, he made greeting the troops his life's most important duty. Another veteran who is he not here with us tonight is someone that many of you in the chamber know and respect, Mike Chinquette. Mike Chinquette was my chief legal counsel. He is now deployed to Afghanistan. Mike is truly one of Maine's best and brightest, and we send him our best wishes and his speedy and safe return home. Here, here with us this evening, here with us this evening is his lovely wife, Michelle. Our administration is working hard so young Mainers like Mike and Michelle can continue to live, work, and raise their families here in our state. We want our young families to enjoy a growing economy that allows them to prosper and succeed. Mainers are a breed apart. Many of, our, of us value our individuality. We work hard and we take care of each other. I love my state. And I'm proud to call myself a Mainer. I want everybody in Maine to prosper and to succeed. But Maine is at a crossroads. 
we have huge challenges. Higher taxes and bloated government have not improved our lives. Higher energy costs have not attracted major investments to Maine. More welfare has not led to prosperity. It has not broken the cycle of generational poverty. We cannot return to the last 40 years. We can do better than that. We have to move forward. We must be bold. And we must have the courage to make tough decisions. We can do better, and we will do better in Maine. We must keep our young people in Maine. Recently, I asked some Bowdoin College students while I was in Brunswick, what can we do to keep you here? One of them was Grégoire Fauché from Madawaska. He is eager to hear what the future of Maine holds for him. Comment ça va, Grégoire? Ça me fait plaisir de vous avoir ici ce soir. Unfortunately, Grégoire hears more about job prospects in Boston, New York, and even New Hampshire than right here in his home state. He wants to stay in Maine, but he may have to leave to find better opportunities and better paying jobs elsewhere. Greg and his classmates are exactly the kind of people that we want here moving our state forward. He is the epitome of a young man who's looking to live in the state he loves. We must create a business climate that encourages investment that will employ our main children. Recruiting job creators to come to Maine is not easy. The global competition is fierce. Investment capital always goes where it's welcomed and will stay where it's appreciated. As Winston Churchill said, who is one of my favorite people in, in, in life, some people regard private enterprise as a predatory tiger to be shot. Others look on it as a cow they can milk. Not enough people see it as a healthy horse pulling a sturdy wagon. Since we've taken office, we have made Maine more competitive. Whether you agree, disagree, whether I take credit or you take credit, in the last three years, Maine's unemployment rate has dropped to 6.2%, below the national average, and the best we've had since 2008. Nearly 13,000 new private sector jobs have been created since we've taken office. We've reduced bureaucratic red tape. We cut automatic increase of the gas tax. We eliminated almost $2 billion in unfunded pension liability. We right-sized government 
and we're finding efficiencies within state agencies. However, my proudest achievement is paying $750 million in welfare debt to Maine hospitals. It sent the message that yes, we do pay our bills. Because of our efforts, good paying jobs are being created in our state. In Portland, the Amskip Shipping Service has come to town. In Wilton, Barclay Cards is opened up shop. In Brunswick, Tempest Jet. In Nashville Plantation, Irving Forest Products. More jobs have been added to world-class main companies like Maine Wood Concepts in New Vineyard, Malnecki Healthcare in Wiscasset, and one that I would always dream to own, Hinkley Yachts in Trenton. <laughs> we can be a state of entrepreneurial doers. There are 40,000 small businesses in Maine. In addition, we have roughly 130,000 micro-businesses who employ somewhere around 170,000 Mainers. These are the folks and the businesses that drive this economy. If they would each add one person to their employee this year, we would completely transform this economy. We'd have to import workers. So we can be done. Nicole Snow of Sebec is a very successful micro entrepreneur. She created Don Good Yarns. It's a fascinating story. And she does it all on the internet. Nicole is growing her company into a million dollar business at home or on the internet. Nicole, please stand. Many of you may know Mary Adams. This is Mary Adams, very, very young. <laughs> this lady will be somebody that all Mainers will be proud of. Having spent my career in business, I know what it takes to grow an economy. But there is a major push by many in this chamber that want to maintain status quo. Liberal politicians are taking us down a dangerous path, a path that is unsustainable. They want a massive expansion of Maine's welfare state. Expanded welfare does not break the cycle of generational poverty. It only breaks the budget. In 1935, during the height of the Great Depression, FDR, the father of the New Deal, warned against welfare dependency. He said, to dole out relief in this way is to administer a narcotic, a subtle destroyer of the human spirit. The federal government must and shall quit this business of relief. Big, ex expansive welfare programs riddled with fraud and abuse threatens all, and I say all, our futures. Too many Mainers are dependent on government handouts. Government dependency never has and never will create prosperity.
Maine expanded welfare a decade ago. Now Maine Care alone, Maine Care alone is consuming 25% of the state's general fund. The result, we are taking money away from mental health services, nursing homes, job training, education, roads, law enforcement, natural resources. Maine's welfare expansion resulted in $750 million debt to our Maine hospitals. And we just paid it off, and some in this room want to start over. Shame on you. Look at the facts. Welfare expansion will cost Mainers $800 million in the next decade. It will cost $150 million in the next three years. It will cost Mainers way too much. Maine's current welfare system is failing our children. I deal with it every day. On the weekends when I have parents coming in to see me and I see these children that are abused and don't get the services and needs that they deserve. Our elderly, our disabled, our mentally ill, thousands of our most vulnerable people are left on waiting lists. They need your compassion. They don't need someone saying, we'll chip away at it. That's an insult. Michael Lavasser is here tonight. He's from Carmel. He has autism and needs care 24-7. Michael is here tonight with his parents, Cynthia and Paul. Cynthia had to quit her job, take care of her son. They downsized their home to make ends meet. With services, Michael would qualify for a job coach, assisted living accommodations, and participate in a day program. Maine lawmakers, you must address the waiting list. Michael deserves compassion. must set priorities on who gets services from our limited resources. Money grows on trees in Washington, D.C. I do not have the means or the ability to grow money in our main forest. Let's be clear. Maine will not get 100% federal funding for welfare expansion. It's a pipe dream. Maine already expanded. That means the federal government will give us less money than those states that are currently expanding for the first time. Adding another 100,000 people to our broken welfare system is insanity. It's unaffordable, and it's fiscally irresponsible. If you look at it from a very, very simplistic way, there are 653,000 tax returns filed in the state of Maine annually. With an expanded welfare, we will have 420,000 people on welfare. Very simple. Expanding welfare is bad for working Mainers because they have to foot the bill. Liberals believe that giving free health care to able-bodied adults while leaving our most vulnerable in the cold is compassionate. 
Folks, I disagree. We must show compassion to all 1.3 million Mainers. We must protect our hardworking families from the high insurance premiums and higher taxes that will result in further from further expansion. We should not be here tonight focusing on the next election. We be, should be focusing on the next generation, like you told us. Nicole and Gregoire need our support. We owe the next generation a society that provides them with prosperity and opportunity, not welfare and entitlements. I will not sit back and allow the abuse of welfare benefits. Maine's limited resources must serve the truly needy in our society. Maine EBT cards provide cash for temporary assistance for needy families. This cash is supposed to purchase household items for children and families. Every dollar that goes to buy cigarettes, alcohol, lottery tickets is a dollar taken away from a child, a family, or other truly needy in our society. My proposal will prohibit TANF funds from being used for alcohol, tobacco, gambling, and other adult entertainment. <laughs> we need to limit the use of EBT cards here in Maine, not in Hawaii, not in Florida, although nice, nice weather down there. But it's inappropriate to have these cards being used in 46 states for over a year. If you want to ask the taxpayer for money, that's fine. You should make a good faith effort to look for a job. We will require those seeking welfare, if able, to look for a job before applying for TANF. Maine taxpayers are being punished because our welfare programs far exceed federal guidelines. Maine has been so lenient with its work exemptions, the federal government is fining us millions of dollars in penalties for violating federal guidelines. We must eliminate exemptions that excuse TANF recipients from work. There is no excuse for able-bodied adults to spend a lifetime on welfare at the expense of hard-working struggling Maine people. <laughs> Folks, that is not compassion. As John F. Kennedy said in 1961, Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. These words are still ring true today. And you know, I had the good fortune to shake JFK's hand in Lewiston when he was campaigning for president. 
And I remember running out to the car, shaking his hand, and the next thing, all I saw was sky, buildings, and pavement. <laughs> and I'm still looking for the guy that threw me over the Jersey barrier. <laughs> I know generational poverty. I escaped gener generational poverty. And I have lived and living the American dream. Some caring Maine families took me in from the streets of Lewiston and gave me the guidance I needed to succeed. They're here this evening. I am so proud to Bruce and Eddie, Bruce Myrick and Eddie Collins. If it wasn't for them and their families, I probably would be with my brothers tonight. <laughs> I have said it many, many times. Education saved my life. Throwing money at poverty will not end poverty. Education and mentoring is the only solution to poverty. The only difference between myself and many in this chamber is you throw money, I want to throw education because it's the only salvation. Our bridge program are providing educational opportunities for Maine students. The Business Academy in Biddeford recently presented, in fact last week, 33 students with a total of 126 college credits for the first half of this academic year. We save those kids thousands of dollars in college tuition. <laughs> Last spring in Fort Kent, between the Fort Kent High School and the University of Maine Fort Kent, and the foresight of their leaders, 17 students, 17 students graduated from high school having completed their first year of college. That was 20% of the graduating class. Later this spring, students in Herman will graduate receiving a high school diploma and some technical proficiencies and trade licenses and certification in the trades. It is working. And many lawmakers, many union leaders, and many school administrators opposed our reforms every day step of the way. But let me tell you something, folks. You cannot keep good people down. When I ran for governor, I vowed to the main people that I would put students and our teachers first. And I will continue to do that. Because at the end of the day, the kids, the graduates, are the future of this state. And we deserve it to them to give them the best opportunities possible. To strengthen Maine's economy, we must invest our resources to improve infrastructure, reduce taxes, lower energy costs for the people of the state of Maine. Industry needs infrastructure to move goods and services at the speed of business. Over the next three years, the Maine Department of Transportation will invest over $2 billion 
and infrastructure improvements. We will replace and repair 54 bridges and reconstruct hundreds of miles of state roads. We will improve our ports, rail, airports, and transit infrastructure. This plan supports over 25,000 jobs in highway and bridge projects alone. Thousands more jobs will be supported by the investment in ports, rail, ferries, and buses. That's putting Maine people to work. That's the good news. But we still have barriers that make Maine far less competitive. Heating and electricity costs remain a major obstacle. Our homeowners spend over $3,000 annually to heat their homes. That's nearly twice the national average. Maine families know that this winter has been a challenge. However, the distribution of natural gas expanded this year in southern and central Maine. Mainers will be having the opportunity to save thousands of dollars by converting to natural gas. More funding is being made available to help Mainers convert to more affordable heating systems. These systems include wood pellets, advanced oil systems, natural gas, energy efficiency improvements, and certainly heat pumps. Anything that will cost less for Mainers, I will support. My administration is working hard to expand pipeline capacity from Pennsylvania to Maine, to take advantage of that state's abundance of natural gas. Further, high electricity costs also make it very, very difficult to attract investment. Our neighbors in Quebec have the best clean energy resources on the planet. They have an overabundance. My administration is fighting to access this cost-effective and clean source of electricity, along with the rest of the New England governors. We have making a breakthrough with other New England governors in looking at big hydro and natural gas. It's an improvement that we have not seen over the last three years. However, in this chamber, many lawmakers have chosen to support powerful special interests over the needs of Maine's ratepayers. Let's be clear. I do not favor one form of energy over another. I am on the side of those who want to lower energy costs for working Maine families. Whose side are you on? I ask everyone here tonight Whose side are you on? Because Mainers need relief. Tonight, I am going to be proposing a bold new idea to attract companies that will invest $50 million or more and create 1,500 jobs. My proposal will offer valuable incentives for companies that choose to locate in certain areas that we will call open for business zones. Open for business zones will offer discounted electricity rates, employment tax benefits, and provide access to capital. Companies in these zones will get assistance to help recruit and train, train their workers. Employees in these zones will not be forced to join labor unions. They will not be forced to pay dues and fees to labor bosses. They will allow Maine 
as a state to compete with other right-to-work states that are getting all the investment. Companies in these zones, however, must show preference to main workers, companies, and bidders. Our proposal combines the kinds of incentives being used very successfully in southeastern states to attract major investments. And I have spoken to many of these CEOs who have told me that they're going to Alabama, South Carolina, North Carolina, Georgia, Louisiana, simply because, simply because we're not competitive. We must be able to compete if we want our people to prosper. We must make some bold decisions. We must show our young people like Grigoire that we are serious about providing good paying jobs and opportunities for he and his classmates. <laughs> States with the highest economic growth often have the lowest overall tax burden. We are working hard to combat Maine's reputation as a high-tax state. We passed the largest tax cut in Maine's history. Two-thirds of Mainers are getting income tax relief. Liberals call it tax breaks for the rich. But folks, 70,000 Mainers, low-income earners, will no longer pay income tax. We cut taxes for the working poor. This, my folks, my dear friends, is compassion, not rhetoric. We are putting money in people's pockets. We told the business community we are serious about tax reform. And I am proud on the modest progress we are making. But we need to do much more. Our tax system is out of date. It is not competitive with other states in our country. So let's ask Mainers in a statewide referendum whether they want lower taxes. I believe we must lower our income tax rates and eliminate the estate tax to bring Maine's tax system into the 21st century. This would make Maine more competitive for people to work, raise their families here in our great state. It would encourage the multitude of retirees who leave our state in the fall to stay at home right here in Maine. This will protect our working class families from bearing an unfair tax burden. My proposal also includes a limit on growth in state spending. This will provide much needed relief to Maine taxpayers. Let's stop arguing about tax reform. Let's ask the people who really matter. Let's ask Maine's hardworking taxpayers. We will ask Mainers a simple question at a statewide referendum. We will ask them if they want to lower the tax by at least $100 million, and we'll reduce state spending by $100 million. We shrink government. We think Mainers want tax relief. Let's give them the option to decide whether they want big government or smaller government. 
Finally, folks, we must confront a troubling epidemic. It is tearing at the social fabric of our communities. While some are spending all their time trying to expand welfare, we are losing the war on drugs. In 2013, 927 drug addicted babies were born in our state. That was more than 7% of total births. Each baby addicted to drugs creates a lifelong challenge for our healthcare system, schools, and social services. The average cost of a drug-affected birth in 2009, this is in 2009, was $53,000 per child as compared to $5,900 for a natural, healthy birth. Welfare programs in this country covered 80% of the increased cost. More important than cost are the effects on these innocent children. I am deeply concerned about the suffering and long-term consequences these newborns will be subjected to. It is unacceptable to me that a baby should be born affected by drugs. We need to show compassion for the newborn babies in our state. In addition, there were 163 drug-induced deaths in Maine in 2012. Deaths by drugs is overtaking deaths by car accidents in our state. The use of heroin is increasing. Four times as many people died from a heroin overdose in 2012 than in 2011, four times more. Over 20% of all homicides were related to illegal drugs. We must address this problem. Drug addiction and drug trafficking is a cancer we can do without. We must act now. We need to fully fund the main drug enforcement agency. Our police chiefs tell us law enforcement officials need more resources to fight the drug problem in our state. Auburn Police Chief Phil Crowell is the president of the Maine Chiefs of Police Association. He is here tonight to show that the chiefs fully support our administration's war on Maine's drug problem. I am pleased also that the county sheriffs also enthusiastically support our initiatives. Folks, whether you're a conservative, libertarian, Republican, liberal, progressive, Democrat, green, blue, I need to tell you this, Henry Ford, said many times, coming together is a beginning, keeping together is progress, and working together is success. The judicial branch, the executive branch, and the legislative branches join forces in an effort to eradicate domestic violence from our state. We have all worked together on that, and we are making some progress. 
We need to come together once again to combat Maine's drug problem. My proposal adds new special drug prosecutors, four of them, adds four new judges to sit in enhanced drug courts in Presque Isle, Bangor, Lewiston, and Portland. Chief Justice, she'll decide. I'm just making a suggestion. <laughs> Since local agencies do not have the manpower or the resources they need to fight drug problems, we will add 14 MDEA agent positions. These are needed because we have a lot of meth labs along the state, and they've gone from 10 to 20 to 40, and now Law enforcement is faced with moving. They have met labs that are moving. They're rolling met labs around the state. We cannot allow our law enforcement agencies, members of the public, to be blown up in one of these meth labs. We have to stop them in their tracks. We must hunt down the dealers and get them off the street. We must protect our citizens from drug-related crimes and violence. We must save our babies from lifelong suffering. In closing, I welcome common sense solutions to, from anyone who wants to put Maine on the right path. Success does not happen without hard work. Bring me bold solutions. Put your politics aside. Fight for the future of Maine people. We must show our youth the path to success. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a pleasure to be here with you tonight. May God bless you. God bless the state of Maine. God bless the United States. And folks, it's time to get to work. Thank you. Okay. Governor Paul Page is leaving the House chamber after giving his speech, which Ran about 50 minutes by a rough count. Uh, he's shaking some hands with folks as he leaves the chamber. Uh, this is sort of traditional. We've seen this on uh, all of these State of the States from the first televised one when uh, Joe Brennan, a Democrat, was governor back in the 1980s. And the governor is now leaving the chamber and proceeding back to his office with his entourage. The legislature is still in session in this joint convention, so we have to wait until the convention is over. And uh, the House and Senate members have left the chamber before we can go to the Democratic response with uh, Jennifer Rooks, who will be uh, talking with two Democratic leaders, the, the uh, House Majority Leader, Seth Berry, and the Assistant Senate Democratic Leader, Ann Haskell. Uh, joining me here just off the House chamber to talk about tonight's speech is Jim Melcher. Jim's a professor at the University of Maine at Farmington. Uh, Jim, what's your thoughts about this speech? Well, I mean, a lot of the themes are things we've heard the governor talk about before, uh, questioning government programs, uh, referring to programs like Medicaid as welfare programs. But some of the specifics were different than that we've heard before. We haven't heard a lot about uh, drug policy, talked a lot about these sorts of things, but certainly it's the kind of themes that uh, if you uh, like the speeches the governor's given before, you'd like the things that he had to say tonight. They were very much consistent with a lot of those sorts of themes about taxes, 
business climate, the rest of it. He sure took some shots at some groups that have been critical of him, though. Certainly uh, some definite shots across the bow of labor unions, environmental organizations. Uh, I think he referred to liberals leading us down a dangerous path. So, you know, some of his speech was conciliatory, but some of it was vintage. Uh, take it to him, Paul LePage. How much of this is politics getting ready for this election year since there were a number of his themes that he had over and over again? Well, if he had been facing a Republican legislature, some of these things would be in a lot better shape than the legislature he's, he's dealing with. You know, I think his business zones proposal is the kind of thing a lot of Republicans would be very friendly to. I don't think a Democratic House or Senate's going to be that interested in them. But he's got a lot of themes that he can use in his campaign that he can point to, and he can say, I've got ideas, I came up with new things, I did things that were different, and that can be very useful to him, even if it isn't passed in the legislature. He can talk about those on the stump as he makes his case for being reelected. Now the speech was broadcast statewide. There'll be a lot of press coverage sure. in the papers tomorrow. How important is this for him really getting his campaign underway and selling these programs to the legislature? Well, I think it's helpful in any setting for this governor to look gubernatorial. We often hear about presidents wanting to look presidential. And being in this kind of setting, the governor tends to do well in giving this kind of speech when he goes extemporaneously, sometimes says things that he has to spend quite a bit of time explaining. I think this was very helpful to it. The most of the mass public probably isn't watching tonight. I, I salute those of you who are tuned in to the fine coverage MPBN is producing, but mostly people are going to pay attention to three or four bullet points they'll see in the papers tomorrow morning, and I think people won't be surprised. I think the people that have liked the things he's been for will be for most of them, but he's got some things like some of these drug proposals that he might be able to get some people across the aisle to help him with. We couldn't help but notice that some of the reaction shots on the floor, on the Republican side, they're standing and applauding, but so many of the Democrats were sitting in their seats. Uh, yeah, you wouldn't expect the Democrats to rise up on the proposal of uh, making it more difficult for unions to organize in the economic zones or that liberals have led us down a dangerous path. I think it's going to be one of the quotes people remember out of this speech. And you really can't expect Justin Alphon to jump out of his seat and applaud that you're calling liberals people leading you down a dangerous path. But we see this in the State of the Union address. That's not unusual. We see this all the time in this kind of speech and it's a way that they can send a message about whether they're happy or whether they're not happy but he had places where both sides stood and applauded him some of which surprised me you've studied a lot of campaigns was the governor trying to reach his base or was he trying to convince those undecided voters who will decide the election come mm -hmm. next November? Well, I think some of both. Certainly he did a lot to reinforce his base. You know, he's talking about cutting taxes, cut the estate taxes, uh, help the state economy, took his shots against unions, took his shots against environmental organizations, the, the special interest groups that he talked about dominating policy. But on the other hand, I think some people are looking for him to offer ideas and some sort of serious proposals, and I think there's a piece of it that definitely was designed to appeal to those people too. So I think that he had a tray of goodies for both of those groups of people. So when folks start trying, when folks are trying to assess tonight's speech, what kind of mark would you give it, Professor Melcher? Yeah. I, I'd give him fairly good marks. I think this is the kind of setting, as I said, where the governor is relatively effective. In a few places, you just think, oh my goodness, he's never going to get this done. You'd rather he might talk about some things that were more plausible, but some of these things are very plausible. I think I'd give him a good, solid, uh, what, you know, Got to be neutral about the policy content, but in terms of delivery, in terms of any governor performing, I'd give him a solid B for the speech that he gave tonight. Jim Melcher, some thank an easy grader. <laughs> <laughs> Jim Melcher, thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure. We're now going to go down to the floor of the House of Representatives where Jen Rooks has two members of Democratic leadership to respond to the governor's speech. That's right, Mal. I'm here with uh, 
Assistant Senate Majority Leader Ann Haskell, Senator Ann Has Haskell, and uh, Representative Seth Berry, who is House Majority Leader. Thank you for joining us. I know it's a little chaotic right after the speech, but why don't I start with you, Seth? What was your reaction to the governor's speech tonight? You know, there were some nice moments. Um, I appreciated the talk about opportunity and the talk about compassion. And, uh, um, you know, that I was really hoping to hear more specifics about how he was going to advance uh, those ideals. Um, I didn't hear them, unfortunately. I, I feel like, you know, the, the facts on, uh, really um, suggest a different picture. Um, you know, we, we heard talk about uh, Maine's recovery, but we know that Maine's recovery, in fact, has been a third worst among all the states in terms of the number of jobs we've added back since the recession. Um, you know, I heard talk about compassion, and yet, you know, we have more child poverty, one in four children living in poverty today. Uh, we have, we're, you know, the governor wants to deny uh, 70,000 people, excuse me, 70 million people health, 70,000 people health care, um, and, and uh, that would be paid for by the federal government. Uh, that, to me, is not compassion. Um, we have longer lines at the soup kitchens, and more people are homeless in Maine. That's not compassion. So, um, you know, I, I think it was long on campaign rhetoric, and although I wanted to hear some specific proposals that would really move us forward and create that opportunity for all, unfortunately, I did not hear them tonight. All right, Senator Haskell, what about you? What was your response to the speech tonight? I'm not sure we hear, heard a lot that was new tonight. Uh, a proposal for uh, sending a referendum out to the people for a hundred million dollars worth of tax was uh, without any backup or facts or understanding of what that really meant. So those things seem to me to be lacking and there was a lot of talk about uh, the health care, uh, expanding uh, Medicaid and calling that welfare, it's health care and that's important to people and I think we need to recognize that that we're not talking about health care here we're talking about people having to have their own family physicians and being able to get the kind of care they need. Uh, Senator Haskell and Representative Barry uh, by my listening there were three new things tonight one the expanded zones that as we mentioned would um, make Maine a right to work state especially in those zones uh, Two, the um, reforms that you were talking about Seth um, the um, uh, the tax proposal. The tax proposal. Yeah. And then, and also um, the proposal to beef up MDEA and sure. to fight drugs. What do you think of the third one? Well, on the third one, uh, Senator Haskell is more of an expert in, than I, having been the, the chair of and the I'm criminal justice. Talk about it. But I will say, that I, I wanted to hear the word treatment, and I didn't hear it, uh, Senator Haskell. No, we can't. We cannot. Uh, we're not going to be able to arrest our way out of a drug problem. We've, been, we've lost that war on drugs by arresting and arresting and arresting. And all we end up is with more people in jail and more people addicted. We've got two sides to this problem. One is the demand side and one is the supply side. And we've done nothing on the demand side. In other words, are we providing treatment to people who need treatment? Are we helping them to get off drugs in order to have productive lives? Are we taking away the very supports that help them in order to manage that, that, uh, those addictions? That's health care. That's where we need to be looking to make sure that we're looking at both sides of this equation and simply to put, while we more, may need more MDEA agents on the ground, if we don't balance that out with additional services for those people, then we are going to continue to lose that war. All right, Seth Barry, let's, oh, go ahead. I just want to uh, mention, too, I, I think we all agree that there is a problem here that needs to be solved. There's no question that the number of drug-addicted babies that are being born, the number of people who have substance abuse issues um, needs to be addressed. It's a matter of how you do it and what, you know, what's going to be successful. What's the balance? Yeah. Let's turn to that tax proposal, the hundred $100 million uh, in tax relief. Is this the first you've heard of a potential uh, referendum on this topic? It is the first that we've heard, and I look forward to seeing the details details, but it sounds to me an awful lot like uh, Tabor 3.0. Um, and Maine people have rejected those kinds of proposals again and again and again uh, at the ballot box. So I don't expect it to be successful. It does sound like an election year ploy, uh, you know, and, and, uh, and yet I, I certainly will be uh, open to the proposal and look forward to seeing the details. Senator Haskell, is there anything in the proposals tonight that you can work with? Absolutely. Governor began and ended with saying let's work together bring us ideas and that's what we want we're here to do the people's work and I want to work with anybody who wants to do it and I'm delighted at the opportunity to understand that the governor's door is open for us to bring ideas representative Seth Berry and Senator Ann Haskell anything you'd like to add 
No, I think the, uh, the senator uh, said it just right. You know, the governor's um, beginning and ending, the talk about opportunity. I appreciated that he quoted uh, JFK, that he quoted FDR. I wish that he would advance more proposals that they might have advanced, uh, but I think that we have the opportunity to work together. Um, the governor needs to send us a supplemental budget proposal. We need to hear real proposals that will move Maine forward at this time. Um, I, I wish we'd heard a little more, but I think we have some opportunities to work together as long as we uh, hear from the governor some of the specifics. All right, and Senator Haskell. Thank you. I agree with uh, Representative Barry, and I'm really looking forward uh, to getting to work on resolving what are the budget issues that are facing the departments that are facing us now, making sure that if we have waiting lists, the governor found the time and the money to make sure the waiting list for concealed weapons permits was closed, and there's no more waiting list for that. If he put the kind of effort into the waiting list for some of these other folks, I think we'd be better off. All right, Democratic leadership. Mal, back to you. Thank you, Jennifer, and thank you for watching and listening here on MPBN to our coverage of Governor Paul LePage's State of the State Address. I'm Mal Leary. My thanks, along with those of A.J. Higgins and Jen Rooks and the entire production crew here at MPBN. Good evening. Support for this program is provided by MPBN member contributions and by... Lambert Coffin, offering strategic legal counsel to Maine businesses, individuals, and families, a statewide practice with a local presence. Offices in Blue Hill and Portland and online at lambertcoffin.com. AARP Maine, working on behalf of Mainers 50 plus and their families. More information online at aarp.org me and on Twitter and Facebook at AARP Maine. MEMIC, a workers' compensation insurance company celebrating more than 20 years of serving Maine employers and their employees. Dedicated to a balanced workers' compensation system that reduces injuries and keeps costs down. MEMIC.com.